kind of odd for me because I'm usually in that side of the fence, but today I'm this side of the fence. Um, but more importantly, uh, just to kind of kick things off, all week long, a lot of the buzz here at many of the sessions, uh, be it upstairs, downstairs, probably particularly in the smoking section way in the back, uh, it's been about the international music services launching, or more importantly, trying to launch in new markets all across Asia and all across the world. Now, as we all know, in order for these services to launch, these music services can't even think about opening shop unless they have the big three major labels, Sony, Universal, and Warner, on board, signed, and sealed. And if we were to picture sort of how these negotiations go and we think about the velvet painting with all the dogs at the poker table, there's actually a fourth entity that is now sitting at that bargaining table. It's Merlin. Now, for any international music service, Merlin is no longer a negotiating periphery. If anything, it's become a negotiating necessity. Who is Merlin? What is Merlin? And why have they become so important and influential uh, as a mover and shaker on the international music scene? And here to demystify, Merlin is the man behind the wheel on what Fast Company magazine listed as one of the top five most innovative companies in the global music industry and uh, pegged by Billboard magazine, actually, as one of the top 50 international power players. That's a, that's a good one to mention at cocktail parties. Uh, it's actually an honor and a pleasure to present to you the CEO of Merlin, Mr. Charles Caldas. A little Thanks. round of applause, please. Um, now, for some of you out there, they may actually not know Merlin because it's something that's very much well-known in North America and Europe, but perhaps not so much in Asia. How did Merlin start, but more importantly, how did it move from being a conversation among indie music heads to really becoming a movement representing the rights of uh, the indie music industry worldwide? Well, I mean, uh, Merlin really came out of independent labels around the world, seeing the digital, digital revolution coming and trying to plan how to deal with it. You know, in, in the, the physical market, we lived in a networked world where we each had our territorial, regional businesses and all connected to each other. The, the, the movement of the consumption and distribution of music from that territorial model to the online model created all sorts of challenges, both for the labels and the services. So global distribution, global availability um, was what the services wanted, but outside of the, the three or four majors as it was at the time, getting to the indie sector involved thousands of negotiations around the world. So that was really the, the seed of the idea, is to look at how you plug that disconnect. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, to, 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 to where we've got to and how we've become the, the dog at the poker table and the velvet painting, which I actually prefer to the billboard thing, I think I'm gonna use that more, um, is, is you know, really seeing proof of concept come to play. So Merlin was born at the same time as, as the market moved into the streaming world and particularly with multi-territorial and global services, very quickly it became evident that not only was the benefit to our labels that we represented having immediate access to those platforms as part of a big value, a, a big basket of rights, but from the services point of view, looking at getting you know, what was really the fourth largest basket of rights in the world or the fourth most valuable basket of rights in the world via, via one transaction. Um, now, Merlin started in about 2007, mm -hmm. if I'm correct, and it's, it's grown, I would actually say, exponentially. Mm -hmm. Just for those out there to kind of wrap their heads around how big Merlin's gotten over the past uh, eight years. Mm -hmm. My math is a little off, but, um, but seven. seven years. How, um, how big is Merlin now? So, so Merlin now represents over 600 companies from 39 countries. Uh, together it represents about uh, 20,000 record labels. But the more important measure for me is where, uh, on the platforms we're in business with, where you know, 10 to 12% of the world market, depending on the service, and, and really are positioned as, as the fourth partner to those, to those platforms. Now, when we talk about independent labels, indie music, indie artists, individually, collectively, uh, there seems to be a gap, if anything, perhaps a gaping one at that, between perception and reality. Uh, the perception is, you know, indie's often synonymous with minor, perhaps niche, uh, maybe even marginal. Uh, but the reality is indie is not just a fashion statement. If anything, it's become a very powerful financial statement. Um, indie is getting b is big, mm -hmm. and it's getting bigger, uh, not only critically, but also more importantly, commercially. Mm -hmm. 
why is indie so essential to the success of international music services? Well, I, I think the independent sector is the one sector in the business that's growing really healthily. Um, it's innovative, it's, uh, it it's, uh, adopts new technologies very quickly, it's creative, it's, it's risk-taking. And I think we've seen that play out in the last couple of years, as you say, commercially. Um, half of all the winners of Grammy Awards in the US this year were signed to independent labels. Uh, in the UK in the 2013, it was the highest chart share um, in the top 20 of independent uh, music since the days of Britney Spears and the Backstreet Boys and Jive. So I think, you know, partly it's, it's the fact that investment is coming for domestic repertoire, particularly outside of the Anglo-American markets, is coming from the independent sector. But I also think that independents have been very clever and very creative in how they've used the digital revolution to, to find an audience and to convert that potential audience into commercial reality. Mm. Now, you were mentioning the fact that in the UK, uh, indies, you know, not only dominate the, the charts, but also... Uh, there was an interesting poster you put up recently where uh, at one of the major festivals in the UK, if you actually wiped out the indie acts mm -hmm. from that lineup, it pretty much became uh, an empty poster or in some instances concept art. But in the US um, right now, uh, indie music as a whole now takes up the largest market share uh, in the US music market, um, more so than Universal, Sony, and uh, Warner. Um, but what's really particularly interesting, because for the sake of referencing and dropping names, uh, there are certain services that decided not to negotiate with Merlin, and there are other services, Spotify, uh, RDO, Deezer, mm -hmm. Beats, that made a very concerted effort to reach out to Merlin first, mm -hmm. um, among and along with the majors. Um, obviously, MySpace, and these other services, mm -hmm. why do you think there was sort of a difference in the success of these services by reaching out to indies? Well, I think, you know, from, from day one and from, from you know, the, I think the first two things I did when I started this job, the first was trying to explain the independent uh, sector to the news corporation who at the time owned MySpace, which was a soul-destroying exercise. And on the other hand, actually talking concurrently to Spotify, who hadn't launched at that stage, but had been doing some research into what kind of music their test bed audience was actually looking for, which led them to the independent sector. And I think broadly we've seen those two approaches to the licensing of digital music services. And it's interesting and I think evident and obvious that the services that actually understand the new dynamic of the music industry and the fact that in, you know, in 2014, you know, the, the music industry doesn't look anymore like it did in 2007 or 2005 or the 90s. You know, independents, as you say, are now the leading uh, block of rights in the US market. We think they're the leading right block of rights uh, in, in the global basis. So I think the services that have understood that and understood that their customers, when they come to a platform, they don't really care what label Adele's on or what label Gaga's on. They're coming to, to hear that artist. So I think giving people the full range of music and a deep and a proper engaged musical experience keeps people there. I think launching a service in the way that MySpace did where you could go and, and listen to Green Day but not the Arcade Fire, or you could have, you know, to, to use, you know, you could, you could listen to, um, I don't know, Jason Mraz but not Armin Van Buren, just made, made no sense to consumers. And I think, you know, consumers are very impatient and very smart, and if they don't find what they want, they'll move somewhere else very quickly. Now, among the many motivations as to why the indie music scene um, got together and set up Merlin, obviously the promotion of indie music, but something that maybe not, may not get as much headlines is the fact that you guys have been not only very active, but aggressive in the protection of mm -hmm. indie music. Um, in some of the cases that you guys have worked on over the years, what are some of the highlights that you have uh, accomplished um, in the area of protecting indie music rights. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the other form, you know, reasons for the formation of Merlin was the fact that as piracy went from physical to digital, it became more profitable for the major record companies to sue platforms direct than to have the trade associations act on their behalf. And the Kazar case was the first example of that where there was very, very large payments to the major labels. It was painted as an industry settlement, but independents got none of that money. So the f one of the first things we did was, was you know, the majors were suing LimeWire at the time, so we did the same, and we positioned ourselves there. We looked, there was a, 
a lawsuit against XM and Sirius for a recordable device. Uh, Groove Shark was in the marketplace. So, I mean, I suppose that the highlight for us is that we've managed to return in excess of $10 million in sediment revenues back to the independent sector where their rights were abused alongside the majors. I suppose the flip side of that and the positive side of that that we're seeing with the evolution of piracy is the, the ubiquity of, of legitimate licensed music, often available for free, is really disincentivizing that behavior. And so we're now living in a world where we're looking at creating value and, and enabling new entrants rather than going after people who are stealing music, which I think is good news for everyone. Um, and you mentioned, you know, now more so than ever, uh, a lot of the new music services um, are dedicated to streaming. And mm -hmm. streaming um, has really been uh, a focus of a lot of debate over the past year. Um, whether it's online, offline, even on air, there's a lot of debate among artists on the vices and, and, and virtues of streaming music services. Um, there are artists obviously now taking sides be it pro, be it con, as to who's really profiting, and, and frankly, those who think that they're being conned outright. Um, but the facts, the statistics, the numbers are undeniable that streaming has become one of the biggest and fastest sort of growth engines in the music industry worldwide. And I was wondering what your stance, what your take is on the state of streaming music, and more importantly, sort of what is Merlin doing to either tackle the challenges or, or embrace the opportunities in the streaming music space? Well, I, mean, I think the first thing to say is we're, we're at the very beginning of the streaming revolution. I mean, I think the last publicly published figures on the number of global subscribers to digital music services was 28 million. If you compare that number to the amount of people that bought a CD globally in, the, in, in, a year, in that same year, or people who bought a download on iTunes in that year, or some, some other platform, it would dwarf those numbers. Uh, so I think we're, we're, we're at the very, very beginning of that. But financially, and I think for the independent sector, I mean, one of the interesting things we've seen with independence in the streaming space is because streaming platforms remove the notion of a shop window. So in, in the physical world, there was a limited amount of slots in a CD store and everybody was fighting for those slots. And the people who had the most money to spend got the slots. iTunes and the, <coughs> sorry, the download model kind of turned that onto its head in that there was a new ubiquitous shelf space, but there was still a front door you had to get to by virtue of the landing page. Streaming has democratized that, so you can come in via Twitter, Facebook, you can come in from a fan page, you can search, you can do all sorts of things. What uh, And that's been very, very good for independence. So if we look at our market share between physical download and, and streaming, the highest market share we have by a long shot is in the streaming space, because I think that space really rewards discovery and broad um, uh, you know, broad consumption. The commercial impact on that is that, I mean, for Merlin alone, and we've just sort of done these numbers, uh, in the last 12 months alone, we've uh, collected $89 million in royalties just from streaming and subscription. That doesn't include YouTube or any of the, the, the additional players. And the rates of growth suggest that in a year's time, that's going to look something like 150 to $170 million. And, and the, the, the adoption of, of streaming into the mainstream looks like the healthy part of the ecosystem. I mean, I'm a, I'll, I'll often describe this like a farm, you know. Th there's a new sort of crop you've planted that's going crazy, and you have to, as a farmer, you have to make a decision which crops you're going to go with next year. I think we need to pay more attention to the one portion of the market that's growing. But, you know, I, th I think the, the, the commercial reality, and I suppose our gold standard on this, is to look at what's happened in the Nordics. So, and the, you know, in the Nordics, we had exactly the same cycles that you described, you know, people freaking out about free music and subscription was gonna kill everything else and those markets were going to, to disappear. If you look at Norway last year, there was an 11% growth in the value of that market year on year in a market where 80% of the consumption is on streaming services. You know, if you translated that proportion to the rest of the, 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 even the 20 major music markets in the world, we would be in a multi, multi, multi billion dollar streaming industry. So I think that that's the potential and that's the thing that keeps us excited and focused on, on how we can grow this space and how we can facilitate, you know, better entrance into it. And I know this is a long answer, but you know, and then I think this relates back to, you know, we, we're really here to support the services that support us. You know, there's still services that come to us with this warped vision of the value in the digital marketplace. 
And, you know, the thing that we say quite publicly now and quite openly is, you know, any service that's stupid enough to come to market now and expect independence to be of inferior value or of secondary importance to their service is going to fail. And I think we've seen it once or twice and we're, and we're going to see that again. Um, what's interesting is you were talking about uh, the Scandinavian sort of um, benchmark, um, Norway in particular, but we're starting to see similar things happen in, uh, in Sweden, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yep. the birthplace of Spotify. Um, but the, the lessons that we're starting to see emerge in, in Europe uh, do you feel that it's exclusive to Europe, or do you think it's actually applicable to what you're seeing here in Asia um, yeah. over the, say, past year, year and a half? Uh, what are some of the trends you're seeing um, in not only the digital music space, but more importantly, uh, in the streaming music space? I mean, we're, you know, the, the streaming business is, again, in, in an even earlier phase in this region, but looking at the patterns of, of consumption and revenues that we've seen in you know, the, the key markets where we're in business in this region, the patterns look the same. Uh, you know, we've now walked through, I don't know how many territories, uh, territory launches with our streaming partners, and the cycle is very, very similar. You know, streaming services come in, there's a lot of fear and concern, uh, the consumer starts to like the product more and more, and the growth happens, and I mean, I, I look at the pattern in the first, or if I looked at the pattern in the, in the, the, the first, um, or the last 12 months, I should say, in our key markets in this region, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in, 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 in Taiwan, the, the rates of growth are pretty much identical to the rates of growth we saw in some of those leading markets now. So I think we should be really encouraged in this region that, you know, this is a product that consumers like. Um, you know, if, if we're talking Singapore specifically here, you have a, um, you know, an e economically viable, uh, technically connected, uh, infrastructure here that is going to, you know, have the opportunity to provide Singaporean consumers with access to exactly the same experience that people around the world have. And I think, you know, the, the exciting thing for me is that not only are we seeing the, the major music markets develop, um, you know, new incremental revenue and, and, and additional revenue to what was there, but we're going to see new value come into the market in regions that we were thought were potentially of, of very, very low value. And I think anybody creating in this area or any independent labels working in, in, in this region should be really encouraged by, by at least the early signs of what we've seen here. Okay. And looking forward, if we were to hack or crack your smartphone and take a look at what the next year for Merlin is going to look like, um, what are sort of the bigger issues and the bigger challenges and, and more importantly, the opportunities uh, that the, your organization is currently looking to for the next 12 months? Yeah. Look, I think the challenge, challenges are twofold. The first is maintaining the value of our music in a market where we now have a healthy business, but there's still services we're dealing with that expect our music to come cheap or, or being inferior. And I think we've still got some big battles on that front. Um, I think the other challenge is the fact that as, you know, if the market is getting better for independence, the more digital the market becomes, it must be getting more challenging for the major labels, the, the bigger the market becomes. And one of the things we've spoken about a lot is, you know, the skewing of market shares and distribution shares by major labels to try and get short-term revenues out of services when they come to market so that they preserve the, their sort of old market advantages that they've lost. I think a healthy ecosystem doesn't look like that. So, you know, the challenges are maintaining our value, um, you know, making sure that the services and the, and, and the people who are investing in the space understand where the value in the music industry is and what it looks like in 2004 and what it will look like over the next five years is, is you know, the, the key sort of challenge. And then I think the key opportunity is really, you know, going back to our analogy, is looking at where the market is growing fertilizing it, you know, uh, nurturing it, maintaining its value, understanding it, um, engaging with it in a positive way. Because, you know, I do think ultimately we have to give consumers a great experience. And, you know, the, the, the rise of Netflix, the rise of on-demand television, the, the ubiquity of mobile devices and tablets means that, you know, c consumers are increasingly just becoming accustomed to consuming media in really portable forms. And if we can get music to, to, um, to participate in that, in that ecosystem, then I think we've got a you know, really exciting and healthy future ahead.
Great. Um, before we wrap up and wind down, uh, we'll take three questions from the floor. Um, it's really foggy and hazy here, so <laughs> if you raise your hand and shout out, here, 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 that'll help tremendously. Uh, anybody with a question? <laughs> Somebody that's got the hand up and saying, here, here. Okay, there we go. That's a great idea, by the way. Just lift your phone like a lighter. <laughs> That'll make it easier. Go you ahead. can wave them side to side, too. I was wondering at what point in an independent, you know, smaller label does it make sense to join Merlin? I mean, uh, Merlin, the, the sort of sweet spot for Merlin is really labels or distributors who are taking care of their own digital business in-house and have the ability to participate in that. Uh, Merlin represents both distributors and, and labels. The labels we, we represent tend to have a digital infrastructure within their company and can manage the, the delivery and, and reporting challenges of, of, um, uh, of the digital space. And I do think that, it, that that's, on a label level, that's still a challenge in this marketplace. Having said that, there are increasing numbers of services and distribution services and platforms that are part of our world that really help facilitate the path of individual labels into the streaming space. So I think the range of options available to people uh, are greater than we ever seen, and, and I'm, uh, I'm seeing some really interesting innovations in that, in that space of allowing, um, not only allowing access to these platforms, but adding value to, to how labels participate in the digital space by, you know, whether it's helping the market place, um, you know, playlist or, or, or however it may be. So, um, you know, I, I think that overall, if, if I look at this uh, as, uh, as a whole, I think, you know, the digital space is enabling much more control and, and, and um, an ability to grow your business without having to give as much away as we used to. And I think that's another exciting development. I think that'll, that'll breed diversity, that'll breed creativity. And, and you know, I'm hoping we'll see a whole new generation of, of young labels and, and, and rights companies that are going to have different shapes to anything we've seen before. Any other smartphones in the air? There we go. Hi. Um, you know, you started in 2007. Yeah, that's what you were saying, right? Yes. Um, so, I mean, uh, what was it that you offered to um, you know, other labels that helped you scale so quickly? I think it was just filling a need. I mean, I, you know, the, the, the formation of Merlin came from labels themselves and distributors who um, were looking at the evolution of the market and were already seeing the challenges. So I think at that sense, we already, we, we sort of knew what the, what the shape of it would be. I think what's helped it grow is, is the, the pace of growth of the digital market and, and digital revenues means that it becomes more and more um, sustainable as a, as a rights holder to, to, to manage a digital business and to participate in the digital business. So I think in some ways the fact that Merlin has grown up alongside the streaming market and you know those rates of growth that I've described, I mean if I, so, so our revenues last year were 90 million, that was more than double what it was in 2012, which is way more than double what it was in 2011 and so on and so on. So as value comes into the market, and as the, the geographical spread of these models, um, uh, you know, start, starts, to, starts to take effect, you know, rights holders around the world are starting to look at, at opportunities to, to, to get to these platforms. And it's been really interesting, for, again, from an Asian perspective, just in the last 12 months, and, you know, we don't really do client acquisition or, you know, we're not out, we're not sort of in the biz dev world. We're really there offering what we do to, to labels that need it. You know, we've got our first members in, you know, Korea and, and Nepal and Vietnam and Singapore and, and uh, you know, so, so I think, and, and, you know, and other regions, you know, Brazil and Argentina and Chile. So, uh, you know, I think the, the byproduct of the expansion of the market is, is going to, to drive the expansion of this space anyway. So, you know, long way of saying it's a great time to be an independent. Okay, and last question before we get run off the stage. Okay. We got the little blinking sign that says, please wrap up. Thank you so much, everyone, for sticking around. And, and more importantly, thank you, Charles, for thank spending you, time thank you. with us here. Thanks very much. <laughs>